So there's a truth about being human that I would rather avoid. And that truth is that I'm vulnerable. I pretty much hate this fact. Maybe you would rather avoid this truth too, but it's true. I'm vulnerable. I'm vulnerable to being sick. For example, I just caught one of these stupid summer colds. You're not supposed to have a cold in the summer, but I've got it, and so I've got the cough drop here and the Purell over there for communion. I'm vulnerable here with you. I'm here talking, and as much as I think, it's okay, Adam, just preach the good news, and it's going to be okay, I can't help but feel vulnerable. I can't help but wonder if what I'm actually going to be saying is good news. I'm vulnerable to this kind of self-doubt. And I'm vulnerable in my family. Yesterday morning, I had a dream about one of my children. I left one of my sons in a room with some of my clergy colleagues here in our conference. My colleagues said they would care for him as I left for the bathroom. And when I came back, they had him tied up in a chair and duct tape over his mouth, and they were scolding him. It's crazy dreams. And so I ran into that room and I pushed them aside and I held my son in my arms and I got to tell you that I trust my clergy colleagues. <laughs> but the dream was about my vulnerability as a father with three vulnerable children and a vulnerable wife. People sometimes tell me to enjoy this time with my children because I'll look back at it as the best times in my life. And I often feel vulnerable to judgment about parenting because sometimes being a parent is really hard and I don't always enjoy it. And sometimes being a good son to my father is really hard. And sometimes being a good brother to my siblings can just be draining and sometimes I feel totally inadequate as a husband and maybe you also feel vulnerable in similar ways. Maybe you or a friend has a cancer diagnosis. Maybe there's a divorce, there's a loss of a job, there's a loss of a beloved spouse or friend. And at this moment in our history, our nation feels vulnerable. The Supreme Court vacancy, for example, has left many of us with a lot of questions and anxieties particularly surrounding advances made in women's health care and our beloved LGBTQ family members. And in the back of my mind, at least, as we come to celebrate the 4th of July this week, we know that children are some of the most vulnerable among us. As we've seen our own government separating children from their families and refusing to take responsibility to reunite those families, that will be in the back of all of our minds as we celebrate the 4th of July. So maybe it's true. Maybe it's true that we're all vulnerable. But for some reason, we would rather not admit this truth. I'd rather believe that I have it all together. And I'd rather you believe that I have it all together too. I don't want you to know my fears that at some point you may discover that I'm a total fraud, that I preach love of neighbor and of enemies and the importance of forgiveness and treating people how I would like to be treated, but I often find this so difficult that I sometimes, quite a few times, feel like a total hypocrite. I'm vulnerable to thinking I'm not enough. I'm not doing enough as a progressive pastor to fight for justice and inclusion in the world. I get a case of the shoulds. I should be doing more here. I should be doing more in the community. I should be doing more to struggle for what I believe in. I should be flying to the border, and I should be giving more money to all of the causes. And then I need to remind myself, Adam, take a deep breath. Breathe. Because yes, I have warts, and I have scars, and I have fears. They are part of who I am. I'm vulnerable because I'm a human being. And the best way, maybe the only way, that I know deep down in my bones that I'm loved is to be open about my vulnerabilities. 
Because when I hide them, I hide myself. And when I hide myself, I'll never know that I am fully loved for the person that I fully am. I think this is part, at least, of the message of our gospel passage this morning. Jesus meets three vulnerable people who run to him in desperate hope of an act of love. I want to emphasize two people in this story today, a dad and his 12-year-old daughter. The dad's name was Jairus. He was a man who seemingly had his whole life together. Jairus was the president of a local synagogue. This meant that he was a man of privilege. He had money and power and social influence. He was highly respected leader of his community. He had all of the advantages that his culture could provide, and yet those advantages meant absolutely nothing when his daughter fell extremely ill to the point of death. Jairus loved his daughter, and this love left him vulnerable to the pain and the heartache of possibly losing her. Because of a woman's health issue, the forces of death were about to separate this family. And so with desperate hope, Jairus ran to Jesus and fell at Jesus' feet. Imagine the tears rolling down his cheeks in all of his vulnerability as he begged Jesus repeatedly saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her so that she may be made well. Jesus knew two things in this moment. First, he knew that women matter, that women's bodies and their health matter. And second, Jesus knew that nothing, not even the forces of death, should be allowed to separate families. All families belong together, and so Jesus went with Jairus to heal his daughter. But as the story says, Jesus didn't make it in time. They received word that Jairus' daughter died as they walked to his house, and Jairus hung his head in sorrow. But with great compassion, Jesus said to the man, Do not fear, only believe. The crowd at Jairus' house laughed at Jesus when he said that there was hope for this young girl. But Jesus didn't respond to the mocking crowds, for he knew that God's desire to heal all people, especially women in this case, and to keep families together is stronger even than the forces of death. Jesus took the girl by the hand and told her to rise up. And the girl got up and began to walk around. She was brought back to her dad. She was brought back to her community. Jesus said to the man, do not fear, only believe. And I have to tell you, there are times that I am afraid and that I struggle to believe. Here we get to this part of this sermon that I don't know exactly how to preach. Because like Jairus, I do go to Jesus begging for a miracle and I'm often left disappointed. I don't get the miracle that Jairus' daughter got in my life. And so what do we do with that? The best way that I know to deal with that is to go to Jim and say to Jim, I love you, I'm with you, and this church is with you. And I love Amy, and I love Gary, and I love Judy, and Rhonda, and Heather, and Jody, and all of you who are suffering from either the loss of a loved one, or an illness, or a difficult family relationship. And you know what? That's pretty much all of us. And I'd like for Jesus to perform some miracle right now on our national stage so that we live out his command to the welcome the stranger and to care for the women's health and for the least among us and protect the gains we've made for our LGBTQ family members because we're all vulnerable. And so I read this story and part of me wants to shake my fist at God, yelling at God to perform some miracle for us right now. 
and I don't know, but maybe there's another miracle in this story for us. Maybe the miracle is the vulnerability that Jairus showed. He wasn't afraid to show his fear amidst the crowd and come to Jesus. He believed that in his vulnerability and in his pain that Jesus might care about him and his daughter and his family. And one miracle in this story is the miracle of being open about our vulnerability. As the rich, powerful leader of his community, Jairus could have been, had, had hidden his pain and pretended that he was in control, but he knew he wasn't in control. And despite his resources, he could not do this alone. He knew he needed help. He knew he needed his community. He knew he needed Jesus. And maybe that's the miracle for us. Women's bodies matter. The LGBTQ community matters. Family, families matter and belong together. Black lives matter, along with hundreds of thousands of people from Seattle to New York, from Cheyenne, Wyoming, to Jackson, Mississippi, marched against the evil forces of death yesterday that separates people from one another, and we marched to keep vulnerable immigrant families together, and we the members of the church here at Clackamas United Church of Christ are a family. We have our vulnerabilities. If you were like me, you'd most likely rather hide them. But we're called to share our joys, hopes, and dreams. And we're also called to share our wounds, our pain, and our suffering together. For when we do, we can hold one another by the hand lift one another up, and it is there that we are able to find healing and to be healers of one another. So in our continued struggle for justice for all people, families, women, LGBTQ, family members, may we know that Jesus struggles with us. In our sorrow amidst the pain and the suffering of illness and death, May we know that Jesus is with us in our pain and in our suffering, and he's working to heal the world. And may we be with one another as we work towards that healing, too. Amen. Hi, everyone. This is Adam Erickson, reminding you that no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome at Clackamas United Church of Christ. We are located at 15303 Southeast Webster Road in Milwaukee, Oregon. Our worship service starts at 1030 on Sundays, except for during the summer months, we start at 10 o'clock. If you'd like more information on our church, you can visit our Facebook page or our website at c-ucc.org. You can also reach out to me through email at adam at c-ucc.org. Until next time, grace and peace be with you.